Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service this morning. If you can come in and find a seat, if you haven't already, I want to welcome us all here this morning. We're glad that you're here. If you're a visitor amongst us, I met a, a, a couple of folks that this is their first time here and want to extend a welcome to those. Uh, we've got some welcome bags on the foyer table in the foyer area there. And uh, just some resources, and if you have questions about the church, get a hold of us after the service. Uh, welcome to the people watching online, possibly, and come and see us in person. We'd love to meet and greet you. So in our bulletin this morning, I'll uh, just highlight a few things along the way here. Uh, remind you all of the, the opportunities we have on Sunday mornings for our adult Sunday school classes. We have two different ones, one going through the, a study in Acts. And that starts at 8.30 and then another at 9 o'clock that's working through a video series. Uh, we also have our evening service tonight at 5.30 and welcome you back for that. Pastor Mark will be preaching tonight. Uh, this week brings the men's Bible study on Monday night at 6.45. And so we have that going with the Reformation Truths uh, series. Wednesday night uh, will be our in our midweek service and Pastor Quentin started a new uh study in, in some psalms, the book of psalms, and this week will be Psalm 5. Thursday is the women's Bible study continuing and uh, working through silence, God working, and that's at 9.30 on Thursdays, and then this coming Saturday is our lecture, so uh, that means a busy week. Many of us have been through multiple lecture uh, events. Uh, that are wonderful, and I want to encourage you to come if you've never been before. We've got the sign-up sheet over on the table over there. Runs from about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. The first lecture starts at 9 o'clock on Saturday, ends about 2.30. 
There's some scholarships available if the cost is an issue, and so we would just love to have you here. So please uh, put your name on the list. There's also a note over on the right-hand side of your bulletin about volunteers still needed a little bit for the food prep. And so there's some, I believe, a sign-up sheet over there for that as well. And so if you're able to help in the few days before the lecture, uh, there's some times that are available to choose from. So please uh, sign up for those if you're able to make that job go very well. I also want to have you mark your calendars on October 29th uh, for a Reformation celebration before the evening service. So that's on, on that Sunday, the 29th, we'll have an opportunity uh, for some additional fellowship time before the evening service that day. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a, member up, a membership update noted in your bulletin. I'll just draw your attention to that as well as uh, prayer requests for the URCNA missionaries. Uh, if you have a cell phone, if you haven't silenced that, if you would do that, please, that would be appreciated. I hear a, I hear a ding happening. There's a computer in the back coming through the sound system <laughs> as I'm talking about silencing cell phones. So uh, I think the last, the last thing I have is uh, there's on the, on, I'll call it a, a different book table. We have a normal resource table over there, but Pastor Stan has set up a book table uh, with his latest book as well as some of his other recent books, and uh, those are on a donation basis, and so he'd love to get them into your hands for whatever you might be able to just donate. And so uh, definitely take a look at what he's put together. There's quite the selection, and it keeps growing, and he's probably still writing more books, right? <laughs> Maybe not this moment, but he's a prolific writer. So with that, I'm going to invite... Pastor Quentin up. Thanks, Jay. I think that dinging was our new security system. <laughs> Every time someone walks through the door, we were getting a notification. So that helps us know if someone's here after the doors are locked. Well, with that, welcome to worship. We're glad that you're here with us this morning as we've gathered uh, as God's people as his dear beloved children, uh, to give to him the praise, the glory, the honor that's due to him alone. Let's stand together. We're going to hear God's call to worship this morning from Psalm 135. Let's ready our hearts as we prepare to assemble in the presence of the Almighty, uh, the Almighty God who is constant in his love and compassion, steadfast, and his mercies towards us. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Well, truly, we've come before our God this morning. Let's bow together as we ask his blessing and that he would meet us in this service this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we've gathered at your invitation, clothed in Christ's righteousness, we pray that even today we would join with the psalmist in praising you, our Lord that we would be moved in our heart of hearts to sing your praises, to recount the wondrous works of your mighty right hand, that we would remember that it is we who have been chosen as your beloved people, as your inheritance. And so we ask this morning that you would speak to us by your word and spirit, that you would drive it deeply into our hearts and minds, that we would better understand it and the blessings that come from it, and that we would be moved to praise and worship, to magnify your name, because you're worthy, worthy of worship and praise. We bring these to you this morning in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God greets you, his beloved and dear children, with these words this morning, grace mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
We're going to sing a setting of Psalm 145 this morning as we begin. Psalm 145. Let's lift our voices together in praise. You may be seated. We've uh, launched a study recently in the book of Ephesians, and as week by week we look at different passages that we might be instructed in our Christian living, I want to turn with you to Ephesians 5 this morning as we consider God's Word. I want to look at this also because our catechism questions Uh, align very nicely with the content here, and because it's such an issue in our world today. Ephesians 5, we'll read verses 1 through 21 as we look at our own lives in the reflection of God's holy commandments. Paul writes, therefore be imitators of God. As beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering 
and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit." addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is God's law. This is His will for us that we as His dear children who He's called out of darkness into his wonderful light, no longer live like the darkness. And you saw the, the, the key points in this, sexual immorality, uh, debauchery, drunkenness, covetousness. These are the things that define the world. And we're called to walk differently than the world. Maybe as you get your steps in this week, you can meditate upon this. How am I walking? Not my physical gait but my spiritual gait. How, my, how are my steps? Are they walking in the light of the Lord? Or am I walking in the paths of darkness? Well, we have the opportunity this morning to confess our sins, to examine ourselves in the light of this passage, that it might expose the, the sinful darkness that still is uh, shadowing our hearts, uh, that we might be forgiven of our sins through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I lead in prayer, will you join me silently uh, confessing your own sins that you too might receive the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, this morning as we come to you, as we read your holy word, we are reminded that we are set apart in this world, that the world walks a certain way but you have called us to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. And that if we walk in love, we also walk in light. As you've called us out of darkness, help us to put off the things that belong to darkness. Sexual immorality and impurity, covetousness, debauchery, drunkenness, envy, deceit, Father, help us to search our own hearts, to see those things which are offensive to you, which you call sin, but for some reason are still so bound up with our own thinking and actions. Help us to see them for what they are, darkness, evil, wickedness, shameful things. Expose them, we ask, by the light 
that we may be awakened to them, that we would put them away from us. Father, each of us struggles in in certain ways, none of them particularly unique, but for us, they are sinful struggles, and we lay them before you. We confess and we turn from our sins committed against your majesty and against your holiness. Strengthen us by your spirit according to your word that we might walk rightly as children of light in this dark world. Would you grant to those especially perhaps confronted and convicted for their sins for the first time this morning the blessed assurance of forgiveness in Christ. But that we would all know that each and every day, the free grace of salvation, of pardon and forgiveness because of the precious blood of Jesus. We ask these things in His precious name. Amen. Well, we do have beautiful words of pardon And I want to point your attention this morning to 1 John. Again, week by week, we look at any number of different passages, uh, gospel summaries to highlight this forgiveness. And 1 John's one we haven't used all that often lately. And let me point this out for you. As John uses some of these same images of light and darkness, I'll pick up the passage in 1 John 1, 5, but I want you to see especially verse 9. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son, of Jesus his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now listen, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that the glorious news of the gospel? That the blood of Christ covers, cleanses our sins. And if in humility and in true faith we come before him and confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive them. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You who look to Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins can have that assurance that they have been wiped away, cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. Let's respond to that this morning. We respond by giving of our gifts and offerings in thanksgiving for such pardon and cleansing, but also in in songs of praise and thanksgiving, knowing that if we were not pardoned, we could have no part in Christ Jesus. Let's sing then. We'll remain seated as the offering is collected and we'll sing Psalm 42 as the deer.
What a great refrain to meditate upon as we've just heard the assurance of pardon that though the waves and the billows roll, his steadfast love is my sure repose. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for salvation so rich and free. What a tremendous gospel we have. As we continue this morning, we have our Old Testament reading. As Jay mentioned, we've finished our series in Samuel, and we're reading some of the Psalms of David. We looked at David's life, and so we are now considering a couple of the Psalms that are attributed to David. Uh, Last week, we considered Psalm 4, this uh, lament, and so we are looking this morning at Psalm 5. A little bit longer psalm than the previous two, and yet such an important psalm. Even some of the themes sound familiar to things we've been considering in these recent weeks. Let's listen then to God's holy word. To the choir master, for the flutes, a psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate evildoers. You destroy the works of those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Such rich words as we bump up against uh, the challenges of life in this world and the rich blessings of the security that's ours in the Lord God Almighty. Well, let's go to him as we approach in prayer uh, with praises on our lips, with the petitions that come from broken and humble hearts, and with uh, our thanksgiving for all his blessings as we've been seeing in the book of Ephesians. Join with me as we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you. What a privilege we have as your children, children of the light, beloved children, to come before you, our Father, in worship and even now as we approach your throne of grace in this time of prayer. We ask that our hearts would be tuned to sing your praises that we would see things for what they are. The world in which we live still tainted with sin and wickedness, evil and destruction, as darkness abounds. But as we come to you, we come into your light. And we rejoice in this, these themes of light and life. that we know that because we're in Christ Jesus, we have the light of life. And so we give you praise this morning. We exalt your name. We rejoice and bring you praise. 
especially because throughout the week we struggle. We, we bump up against the wickedness in the world, those who would shame us and tell lies about us. But you are our shield around us. You cover us with your favor. Help us to persist, to keep on running the race you've called and set out for us. Help us to walk in your ways, even in the midst of so much trouble and wickedness. And against, in the midst of those who are against all your holy and righteous ways. Give us the stamina, spiritually speaking, the strength to keep on going for you. Step by step, as we live our lives for the praise of your glorious grace. Father, we give you thanks this morning for all your blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. Even as we've seen in recent weeks, all of the blessings from the heavenly places, rich blessings, election, adoption, justification, an inheritance, and we can go on and on, and, and yet this morning we give you praise and thanksgiving for them. That even already now we have begun to taste and to see those things. To know of our identity as your own dearly beloved children. That we're not orphans in this world, but we belong to your family and as your dear beloved children. Help us to delight in that. And to turn that back to praise and thanksgiving to you. Father, we give you thanks for your blessings upon this church. For new members whom we've recently welcomed. And for new life also recently welcomed. We rejoice that you are the one who gives life through physical birth. But also who gives spiritual life through rebirth. We rejoice in this, that you've worked over the years, even here at Cornerstone, to bring little babes in Christ to faith, to experience the new birth, uh, the new life in Christ. And we ask that you would continue this work as you bring to us visitors, family members, and friends, strangers or passers-by. Thank you. For the opportunity that we have week by week to welcome, to minister, to proclaim the gospel of faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that even today, this message would go forth clearly. Thank you for the privilege that we have to, to freely gather, to assemble publicly, to fearlessly worship and preach and proclaim the good news of the gospel. Father, we thank you for the family of God. That not only are we not orphans in this world, but we can have the rich, deep, lasting fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. As we look, look out for one another, as we meet one another's needs, as we use the gifts that you've given to us in service for another to the praise of your grace and glory. Father, we thank you for Pastor Stan and for Pastor Mark, uh, both of whom are not here today because you are using them elsewhere. We ask your blessing to continue to be poured up upon them. Meet their needs, we ask. Strengthen them, we pray. Use them as they Answer your call in their lives to minister the gospel in various ways, whether it's publicly in the pulpit or privately from house to house or meeting to meeting. We thank you for the elders, Lord, men whom you've called to, to, to lead, to shepherd, to rule and to govern your church. We thank you for the deacons, men whom you've called to selflessly pour out the gifts that you've bestowed upon the church, meeting the needs of your people. And where there's 
where there's access to meet the needs even of those outside the walls of this church. We pray that we would continue to be able to do so as we minister in this uh, needy community. But even such that through the ministry of the deacons, uh, these people would hear the blessings and the comfort of your holy word. We ask today that you would bless the reading and the preaching of the word, that we today might see it more clearly, would hear it more attentively, and would respond to it more zealously. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the ministry of the word and sacrament, that this morning we would be reminded, assured, and convicted of the truth of your word and the blessings that come from it. Father, we offer to you our petitions, that as we live in this world that you would strengthen us. We ask that you would work according to your holy wisdom and will at the broadest and the highest levels of government, that you would work in the lives, in the hearts, in the minds of those whom you've appointed to govern, that they would do so for your honor and glory. And where they are errant and where they are working in ways that are contradictory to your holy commands, that you would call them to conviction. And that even we as your people would act on such conviction to write and to pray and to, to confront the errors of our age, even as we address those elected officials. Father, we see such abuses and such turmoil all around us. Help us to stand with great conviction and courage in such changing times. Father, we ask that you'll bless our families, that husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, children, daughters and sons would see this rich heritage that's ours, that as the world continues to chip away at this basic institution that receives your blessing, that we would work even harder to keep it strong and established, grounded in the grace of the gospel. For the praise of your glorious name. Father, we have such weighty issues on our hearts and our minds for the week. And so even now, we're delighted to lay them at your feet, knowing that you, the God of grace, delight to hear our prayers and in your great power, act in response to them. And so we lay them before you in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we look to our scripture reading this morning, we have the catechism questions that I mentioned earlier. So if you take the order of worship and turn that over, we're on Lord's Day 41 today. We've been working through the Ten Commandments, and this, this morning we come to the Seventh Commandment. You shall not commit adultery, as we all know. And as, like the others... This commandment drives us more deeply to consider what this means. Is it merely the, the act of adultery, the physical act? Or is there more that's both prohibited on the one hand and called to conformity to his law on the other, a positive conforming to it? Well, let's read these two questions and answers responsively. First, question 108. What is God's will for us in the seventh commandment? That God condemns all unchastity, and that we should therefore detest it wholeheartedly and live decent and chaste lives within or outside the holy state of marriage. And then secondly, question 109. Does God in this commandment forbid only such scandalous sins as adultery? We are temples of the Holy Spirit, body and soul, and God wants both to be kept clean and holy. 
That is why God forbids all unchaste actions, looks, talk, thoughts, or desires, and whatever may incite someone to them. Well, again, if there's a a commandment that's at issue in our world today, this is certainly one that ranks high on that level. Pastor Mark's going to be uh, preaching and leading our worship service this this evening uh, in relation to that commandment. So come, come back tonight uh, for worship and to be instructed in God's, God's word. Let's prepare now, though, to hear God's word read and proclaimed. We're going to prepare by singing, Speak, O Lord. We've learned this song over the last couple of years. So let's stand together and sing together these three verses. Speak, O Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're continuing our study in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. If you have a Bible near you, please take that out and turn with me to Ephesians 1. Last week, we finished that very long opening sentence. We broke it into three sections. Uh, each, in a sense, tackling some aspect of our, of our salvation, uh, the work of God the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, today we begin in another long sentence. We're going to break it into two sections, but I want to read the whole thing for us as well today as we, uh, as we consider Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. We're going to read Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. 
Some of these themes we've already heard in the opening doxology or blessing of the Lord, but others help prepare us for what we'll see throughout the rest of this letter. So listen carefully to God's holy word. Paul writes, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, and what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is God's holy word. May he seal it to your hearts today. Will you join me in prayer? Asking that he would speak to us by his word, by his spirit. Our Father, we've read your word. We've tried in the frailty of our human condition to listen carefully to it. So even now, as we prepare to hear it proclaimed, would you work in us to open our ears, our hearts, our minds, that we would hear, see, believe, and respond to your holy word. We ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, dear brothers and sisters, when was the last time you read a a really good book on prayer? It's fascinating, isn't it, that Jesus and Paul expect Christians to pray. Jesus, in his great prayer, teaches us to pray. In a, a number of weeks, we'll get to that as we finish out the year thinking about the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. But Paul also calls Christians to pray. Later, in the end of this book, in in Ephesians, he asks the church to pray for him. Certainly not the, the last place or the only place that he asks the church to pray. And yet, this is probably one of the biggest challenges for Christians, isn't it? To dedicate, to spend time, to commit ourselves to private prayers. Public prayer is kind of easy. It's written into uh, the liturgy, to the order of the worship service. And yet, to have meaningful prayer is still work. I was joking with the elders at our meeting the other day. You know, prayer meetings can sometimes uh, degenerate. And not that we shouldn't pray for these things. We should bring all of our needs and our requests to the Lord. But sometimes prayer lists can become what we call the organ recital. You know, pray for so-and-so's heart. Pray for so-and-so's gallbladder. And we just recite all of the organs with which there are problems. It's the organ recital at prayer meetings. Again, we should bring these needs to our God. But in Paul's prayers, we see that those needs really just skim the surface. They're, they're physical prayers. But Paul helps us to see that our prayers, even as he prays for the church, ought to drive more deeply. Ought to not just skim the surface and, and get on with, you know, the, the obvious things, but deal with heavy, weighty spiritual matters. 
drive us to consider what our deepest needs are, that we might consider how we might pray for one another. How pastors and elders are called to pray for the flock. How we as brothers and sisters ought to pray deeply, earnestly, that God would not just meet our physical needs, and we do pray those things, but also that one another would grow spiritually. That with eyes of faith, we would see all the good things that God has done for us, stored up for us, is holding and keeping for us. When was the last time that you prayed along those lines? Maybe specifically for someone. God, I pray that my friend would see the great blessings of salvation that are hers in Christ Jesus. That we pour out our hearts in prayer for one another. As I was preparing for this message, uh, one author says, you know, Paul, Paul uses what he teaches the church. Again, later, he, he calls the church to pray. And he himself gives us these models for prayer. It would be fascinating, maybe in another series, to just key in on Paul's prayers, to just hit one after another and just lay that out that we might be instructed. But today we have one opportunity to, to touch on, on this prayer, a prayer for the church. And as we do that, I want you to see in the first place Paul's thanks. And it's moving. It's a moving thanks that Paul has for these Christians. In the second place, I want you to see who Paul addresses in his prayer as he prays to the Father. And then finally, I want you to see Paul's petitions. Having given thanks, having praised the Father in, in his address, we see his petitions, what he longs for the church to know, to experience more deeply. So again, Paul's thanks, Paul's address, and Paul's petition. Well, let's jump in as we look at Paul's thanks. You know, maybe if you, you know this acronym, right? If you have been instructed in how to pray, there's different models for prayer. You can model your prayer after the Lord's Prayer uh, or Paul's prayers, or you can use the, the ACTS. You remember that acronym? Um, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. These are parts of prayer that are common in the Christian life. Well, as Paul begins, as he speaks, as he writes to his brothers and sisters with whom he may have spent up to two years teaching, he highlights his thankfulness for them. Listen again to these opening verses in this section. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Isn't that moving to know? If you were an Ephesian Christian and heard this letter being read in a corporate worship service, to know that Paul, the apostle, was praying for you, giving thanks to God for you. But the greater reality is, is that in some ways, this is what Jesus does for us. He's the one who prays for us. Much greater than Paul, Jesus prays for us. But as we think about this, as we look at Paul's prayer here, this prayer of thanksgiving, I want you to note a couple things to consider. Because our tendency as people is to be selfish. Our inclination is not first and foremost to express our thankfulness to others. Maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think I am. When was the last time in your prayer you thank the Lord for a particular person? Normally, what are we doing? Lord, give me patience. Help me deal with so-and-so. Help me to get through this. How long can you last giving thanks? How long can you go thanking the Lord for His blessings? The blessings of brothers and sisters in Christ. 
the things they've done for you, the encouragement that they've brought to you. You see how meaningful and useful this is? That we rehearse in thanksgiving and prayer and praise to God, but also because in prayer our, our own hearts and minds are bent and shaped that as we give thanks, we're actually recalling and recounting and telling again the blessings of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, Paul dials in on two specific things here as he gives thanks for these Ephesian Christians. He notes on the one hand their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever bumped up against another Christian? Maybe when you didn't expect to find one. And you were elated to, to find a brother or a sister in the Lord. Maybe it's at a difficult time or maybe when you've been traveling. And to say, what a refreshing time to have a, a spiritual conversation with a brother or a sister in Christ. And that can only happen because that person has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That may be something of what Paul has in mind here. But next, we see his expression of thanks for their love for the saints, toward all the saints. Here in this mixed community of Jews and Gentiles, which cuts against the grain of the world, which would divide those two groups, Paul expresses his thanks that this church loves all the saints. That that dividing wall that we'll consider in chapter 2 has been broken down, not just theoretically, not just theologically, but relationally as well. That the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile has been overcome in their love towards one another. What a tangible way to express this. What a meaningful way in a world that at that time was still so divided ethnically that in the church there is this expression of love of God's people for one another. And then you think, what would that look like today? What things would need to be overcome? What barriers of separation? Race? Economics? What other things? That as God's people, we can express love towards one another. Not because we join in with certain activities, but because we are the people of God. His own dear beloved children. Well, these are the two things especially that Paul gives thanks for. And you'll know that they are two of what we call the kind of the Christian triad, right? Faith, hope, and love. Here you have especially the, the faith and the love. We'll come to hope in a little bit. But now that you've been instructed in this, maybe make it your goal this week as you spend time in prayer, as you pray for this church and for Christ's church throughout the world, to give thanks. Maybe specifically naming those individuals who have blessed you, who have been an encouragement to you. Spend time thanking the Lord for their faith, their love, and their encouragement to you. Well, in the second place, I want you to see who Paul addresses in prayer. Have you ever been on a phone and you're like, I don't even know who I'm talking to? Maybe it's a customer service agent or maybe it's just a, a cold call and you're like, who is this? I don't even know. Well, when we pray, it's completely opposite, isn't it? We know to whom our prayers are addressed. We know very clearly, again, because Jesus himself instructs us. Our prayers are to the Father, our Father who's in heaven. Well, Paul's learned that lesson, and he addresses this prayer to God, and he does so with this exaltation. It's not merely that we see who Paul's addressing, but that in his address, he's bringing glory to God. He's exalting him to whom he's addressing We'll pick it up again in verse 18. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, so there is one thing, this, this person whom he's addressing in prayer is God, 
the Lord of Jesus Christ, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, God the Father. We see this in the second phrase, the Father of glory. Isn't that significant? Even as we've heard this refrain in this very first long sentence, that all of this work of salvation is to the praise of God's glory. Now Paul picks this up in his address and in his prayer and highlights this. As he prays, remembering these Ephesian Christians, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, And you pause there for a moment, and you think about what God is like. Think about what He should be thought of as. And He's brilliant in light, dazzling. This is how He he comes across through these presentations in the Old Testament, isn't it? The God of glory comes in dazzling brightness shocking his people, the God of glory. Or another way to think about this is this weightiness. We talked about this in our study in Samuel, uh, that those who dealt with God lightly, who did not give him the glory that he deserved, God dealt with them as if they were nothing, just blown away, as it were, by the wind. But God in his majesty and his glory has this weightiness, this substantive presence of glory as the Almighty King who sits on the throne, exalted over all, receiving the praise of His people. This is who we address in our prayers. And that's humbling, isn't it? We might think, look at me, I'm doing my prayers. (laughs) And then we remember it to whom it is we're praying, the God of glory. He's majestic in holiness, dazzling in brilliance, exalted on the throne. And we come humbly, but boldly, because he's invited us to bring our prayers to him. Well, I want to spend the most of this time on this third point, as we consider Paul's petitions. There's a lot of things bound up here. Uh, it's, it's almost like uh, rapid-fire petitions, and maybe this is how we pray. And so maybe we're used to this. We, we list off all of our, our heartfelt needs to the Lord. And yet, as they'll see, these are characterized by spiritual concerns. For Paul's longing for the church in Ephesus, even those with whom he spent over two years teaching, that they would continue to grow in their understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no stagnancy here. There's no like status quo, well, we're good enough, we've made it. Maintenance mode, right? There's none of that in the Christian life. Paul's prayer is that each and every Christian would continue to grow more deeply in his or her understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No opportunity to just coast along. Say, well, I know what I believe and that's good enough. There's always another way to drill down more deeply, to plumb the depths, to sound them out, and to see afresh the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's consider some of Paul's petitions here. One that we might see how our own prayers can be instructed. Again, Paul prays with thanksgiving. He prays to God the Father, the Father of glory. And then we pick this up in the middle of verse 17. That he may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having your eyes or the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. That's a lot to take in this morning, isn't it? Well, let's break this down a little bit. We might think of these first two. 
in terms of revelation and illumination. The gospel has been proclaimed, but we need help in better understanding it. And so Paul prays that, that God would give his people the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. It should be our prayer. God, give me, give me wisdom that I might better understand your word, that I might better understand you, who you are, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Illumine your word. You know, we've been looking at this theme of darkness and light, uh, even this morning as we work through these passages. And this is part of the idea here, that God would illumine, shine his light upon his word, that not just physically we might see it, that we might take it in spiritually. Sometimes if the house is dark and I don't want to turn on the lights, I'll, I'll use a book light. Even this morning I was up early and the book light was fading. I left it on too long. And it needed to be recharged. And in some ways we need to think about this. We need the Spirit to illumine the revelation. We were introduced a couple of weeks ago to this mystery, right, that's now revealed, this theme that Paul's going to hit on again and again, that the Spirit would illumine that, shine His light, that we as readers might better understand it. We live in a world of emojis. You know, you look on your phone and uh, we have all these characters, right, to express something. I don't think I've seen one yet, but wouldn't it be great if we had like a little heart emoji with eyeballs on it? And you think, what would that express? Well, it would express that our innermost being would have sight. And this is what Paul's prayer is. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. We need this. We need to pray this, that our innermost being would be able to see clearly. That it would be able to, to see through the dimness, the darkness of this world. So that in our heart of hearts, the very seat of ourselves, we'd be able to see clearly. And what is it that we need to see? Listen to what he lists out that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Now, this isn't like the way we use hope, right? Well, I hope I get this for Christmas. No, this is a sure and established hope. We consider that in the other letters that we looked at some time ago. But we need to see this clearly in our, in our innermost self, the hope that's established for us and to which we've been called in Christ Jesus. And then secondly, the riches of his glorious inheritance. And this is a little bit of a twist. We think of inheritance as something that we receive. But the, Paul, the way Paul's using it here, he's showing us that we are actually the inheritance of God. And in which God delights. And that should floor us. To see how much God delights in his beloved people, that we are his inheritance. We are his possession, his treasured possession. We, we're familiar with those themes, they run throughout the scriptures, and yet when we ponder the mystery of that, that we are what God considers to be his inheritance, that which with the blood of Christ he has bought and paid for, that which he has worked from before the foundations of the earth to accomplish. We are his glorious inheritance. But it goes on. You see, are you catching the picture of this? Not the organ recital, right? Those are important. We need to pray for those things, but we need to bring our prayers deeper too that we also might see clearly these aspects of our salvation. You know, Paul listed them out, many of them, in that opening doxology, this gushing forth of praise in that first very long sentence. And now he's beginning to unpack them. And his prayer is that we would actually see 
and grapple with and understand what these things are and how they impact our life, both now and for the age to come. So that we might know God, that we might have hearts enlightened, that we might understand the riches of His glorious inheritance in His saints. And, and here He piles on the words. We live in a, a, a world, in a time where everything's about power, isn't it? All the discussions are about power, who has it or who doesn't. Even in everyday language, you know, it's power lifters, power brokers, rich and powerful. It's the, the language we use often. And in Ephesus, where, where power was important, and not just earthly power, but spiritual power. Remember that demonic forces and, and the people burned millions of dollars of, of spiritual material? powerful forces. Paul piles on the language so that the Ephesian Christians and us today can see that God is more powerful. Listen, that we might see what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Paul saying that great power, that great might that he used to raise Christ from the dead, that we might see that he's using that same power in the lives of his people. Are your prayers like this? Probably none of us could say yes, at least not to this level. But today we can be instructed in our prayer life that we can begin to model our prayers, maybe even pray this passage, put it into our own words, that we might see the beauty, the depths, the glory of knowing God. And really, isn't this what this passage is driving us to see? That we might rightly know God and how because of his deep love for us, we are related to him as his dearly beloved children. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come at the close of this message in this time of prayer, asking you to seal these truths upon our hearts and minds. And so we pray with thanksgiving for our dear beloved brothers and sisters who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and who express their love towards all the other saints. We pray that these would be our prayers continually. Every time we go to prayer, that we would lift up prayers of thanksgiving for our fellow believers. And we ask you, O oh God, God of glory, God of might, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation that we might know you. That as you've revealed yourself in your word and in your word incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would truly know you according to your wisdom and power and that you would work in us by your spirit giving us the wisdom and the illumination to know you better, that our, our hearts might be enlightened, that we might see and know the hope to which you've called us, that which is firm, established, and secure, that we might know the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, how deeply you treasure your own possession. And that we might see and live according to your immeasurable greatness, your power towards us who believe, exhibited most clearly, working when Christ was raised from the dead. 
Father, we ask that you would teach us how to pray. That our prayers would be prayers carefully thought out, crafted, seated in the beginning with these thoughts that they might sprout into and flourish into prayers for one another, prayers of thanksgiving, even as we bring our petitions to you. Knowing that you are the God of glory, who is majestic and powerful, who hears and acts in response. Would you grant that we are a praying people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have a privilege as God's dearly beloved children uh, to come to the Lord's table this morning. Let's prepare ourselves to do just that, that we might come in faith, in humility and repentance and with thanksgiving in our hearts to receive these good gifts from His hand. As we come to the Lord's table, we're reminded that this is not something that we do out of superstition or, or with any sense of uh, magic happening, but that this is something Christ Himself instituted using uh, some of those rich threads of redemptive history, of the sacrifice of the Lamb, uh, commemorating a redemption, the exodus of God's people, as Jesus Himself was going to the cross. He gave His church these signs, the sign of the broken bread, His body, and the cup poured out His blood as a proclamation, proclaiming His death for the forgiveness of sins until He comes again. With that in mind, let's prepare ourselves this morning to come in faith and participate together in communion. To all of you who have believed and with godly sorrow have confessed your sins, the promise of Jesus is sure. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. For the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. But this meal is not merely a remembrance, is it? Because it comes with God's own promises sealed to us even as they proclaim to us the gospel. While remaining bread and the cup, these sacred elements themselves nevertheless become united to the reality they signify, that we do not doubt but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal by the Spirit through faith. It's a key point, through faith, nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For all who live in rebellion against God and in unbelief, this holy food and drink will only bring you further condemnation. So if you're here this morning and you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to live under His gracious reign, we admonish you to abstain today. But all here who repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins are invited to this sacred meal not because you're worthy in yourself, but because you're clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. Do not allow the weakness of your faith or the failures in the Christian life to keep you from the table, for it is given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the Word has promised us God's favor, so also our Heavenly Father has added this confirmation of His unchangeable promise. 
So come, believing sinners, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon this meal, this fellowship meal that we have with him and with one another. Almighty and everlasting God, by the blood of your only begotten Son, you have secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies. That way is opened for us not by the, the blood of bulls and goats, but by the blood of your own Son. You've opened it to us that by faith we may enter in and draw near, draw close to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even now you've signified and sealed that to us in this meal. We pray that you would use it to our comfort, assurance, conviction, and resolution to live our lives in response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We give you thanks that we have such a sure hope, firmly established in Christ Jesus. We ask that even now you would set apart these common elements, consecrate them so that just as we eat and drink bread and the cup, that our bodily lives might be sustained so truly would we receive into our souls for our spiritual life and nourishment the true body and the true blood of Christ Jesus. We receive these gifts by faith, the hand and mouth of our souls. Amen. The elders are going to come forward to distribute these elements. Uh, receive them, hold them. Uh, the cups are double stacked. Uh, the juice is on top and the bread on the, the bottom cup. And afterwards, after we sing, we'll receive them together. We're going to sing as they're past uh, Amazing Graves, How Sweet the Sound.
truly amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I hope you haven't missed that this morning. As we think about the immeasurable riches that are ours in Christ Jesus, signified and sealed to us even by the bread and the cup. The bread which we break is a communion in the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember and believe that Christ's body was broken for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. And the cup of blessing which we bless is a communion in the blood of Christ. Take, drink, remember and believe that Christ's blood was poured out for the forgiveness of all your sins. Let's give thanks as we close this service, giving thanks to God the Father for all of the blessings that are ours in the heavenly places. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you have poured out upon us blessing upon blessing, grace upon grace. We thank you even now for the blessing of this holy feast. Although we're unworthy to share this meal with you, you, by your invitation, have called us, have dressed us in Christ's righteousness so that we might come boldly into your holy presence. Instead of wrath, we've received pardon and mercy. Instead of fear, we have been given great joy and hope. So we give you praise and thanksgiving today, so that as we go forth from here, our lives would bring you glory, would bring you praise as we walk according to your ways, and as we see and perceive more clearly your majesty, your power, your love towards sinners expressed to us in the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, sealed to us by the Holy Spirit, reminded us week in and week out by your sacraments. Thank you that even now, Jesus, our great high priest and mediator, sits at your right hand, interceding for us. We ask that you would strengthen us as we go forth to live for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me as we stand together? We're going to close by singing the doxology. Let's sing it uh, to the glory of our God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father. Go now with your God's blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.